Hi, I'm Xi Chen from Beihan University, which means uh, Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And it's, it's 1 a.m. here, and uh, I would like to say good morning and also good night to everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to give this talk. At first, I want to thank the organizer for the invitation. Also, I want to express my regret that I cannot attend a conference because of my teaching notes here, so I ask for your kind understanding. Uh, all right, now, uh, my talk today is unbounded water turbulence induced by inverse cascade. Actually, this is about two-dimensional wall flows, but it's inspired from the study on 3D wall flows. Uh, by the kind of work, hopefully, uh, I uh, will be get some useful information, uh, help to answer the questions in 3D wall flows. Uh, in reality, we know that most of the flows are three-dimensional, and uh, there's indeed interface here, which is a solid wall, uh, separating the fluids and the solid walls away from each other. And uh, due to the strong shear at the wall, uh, there are very high energy dissipation and the turbulence fluctuations near the wall. Actually, the energy dissipation is the largest at the wall compared to uh, flows in other regions. A long research interest is to understand how these statistical averages vary with the flow speed. So in other words, what is the real number dependence for the turbulence statistics? As paradigm wall flows, the turbulent channel pipe under layer has been studied over a century. According to the celebrated law of the wall by Pronto, uh, near the wall, all the mean quantities scale on the molecular vesicle with velocity nu and the friction velocity u tau, where u tau is defined by the square root of wall shear stress. Now here, the density has been absorbed in the definition of the molecular viscosity, and the capital U indicates the mean flow velocity, and the y is the volume direction. Now in our coming talk, the streamwise direction is indicated by the x, and the spinwise direction is indicated by the z for the channel flow here. Now, from law of the wall, we also have the uh, famous von Kármán log law, uh, which describes that the mean velocity once normalized by the wall variables, uh, which means y plus uh, the wall normal distance normalized by u tau and the nu, and the mean velocity normalized by u tau. By such normalization, mean velocity profiles at different real numbers, and even in the different flow geometries, they all collapse together uh, following this straight line here. Uh, this is a semi-log plot. And this street line indicates the von Kármán log law. The argument behind the log law is the scale of separation, where the inner flow profile follows the law of the wall, and out of profile follows uh, outlands characterization. Uh, the delta is the flow thickness, indicating the half channel height or pipe radius or the boundary layer thickness. Yes, the law of the wall works for the mean velocity, but what about fluctuations? Now, as we know, since the peak fluctuation occurs in the region where the law of the wall holds, the expectation is that the fluctuation energy will also be invariant if normalized by the same wall variables. And this shows the prediction by the k-omega model. We find that for different realized numbers, the k-omega model actually predicts an invariant kinetic energy. But if we look at the experimental data, for example, by Degraff and Eaton, uh, they found that for flow over the flat plate boundary layer, the fluctuation intensity, the peak magnitude, increased notably with real number, although the peak location is invariant uh, in Y plus. To explain such uh, real number dependence, Degraff and Eaton, they invoked the mixed skinny argument, uh, which means that the magnitude of fluctuation intensity scales as a product of the u tau and the free stream velocity. It is not follow the scale of u tau squared. So by this new assumption, as we know that the free stream velocity follows the von Kármán log law, hence the magnitude of the fluctuation intensity peak also followed logarithmic scaling. Recently, Marusika and his colleagues have used Thompson's attached hypothesis to explain this log variation. 
and this does cause to the question a law of the war. Recently, Srinivasan and I, we have a different view regarding the finite resource number dependence of the intensity peak. We note that in the war layer, uh, at a very high risk numbers, the relative stress and the mean shield, they have an exact balance. Some of them okay. they get to one uh, after normalization really by the war variables. Is enough for me? Yep. You have uh... what? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. So this makes the asymptotical maximum of production, uh, which production is one fourth. And at any finite risk number, the defect dissipation. Uh, which means that the measured dissipation away from the asymptotic bound, the one force, is a quantity that describes how far away of the current flow state uh, from the asymptotic state. So such a defect may have a realized number dependence multiplied with a certain proportional coefficient. And in this paper, we have provided rational for m is one fourth. Uh, the value of this m is not the key issue of my uh, presentation today, the key point is that if following this scaling, the dissipation at the wall will be bounded. And by dimensional argument, we can extend such a bounded dissipation to many other flow quantities near the wall. Now, for example, for the fluctuation intensity, velocity fluctuation intensity peak, we suggest a defect power law given here with the same exp exponent minus one fourth. Uh, compared to the logarithmic scaling given by Marusic and War, we see that the two scaling proposals both agree with data well. These symbols are DNS data of channel pipe boundary layer and with also laboratory experiments data given here. So in the current real number range, both scanings agree with data well, but the difference is significant for asymptotic large real number. For the first proposal, the peak intensity will diverge. But for the second proposal, there is asymptotically bounded constant for the fluctuation intensity peak. In order to judge which scaling is better, we do need high quality data at high risk numbers. According to the APS DFD presentation last year by Lucky, the realest number we need to distinguish the two scaling proposals is at realest number 10 power 6 for our etal. And so far, all of the laboratory experiments data uh, their largest risk number is just about 10 power 4. And these experiments data are measured over the desert in the Utah. And you see that by different forces under different weather conditions, there are large uncertainties there. Hence, we cannot draw any solid conclusion. The competition between the two skinning proposals is also reflected in other main quantities. For example, the wall dissipation rate and the wall pressure RMS. The solid line indicates our defect power law, and the dashed line indicates the log law. Both are indistinguishable from each other. We also extend the defect power law to the high water moments of fluctuation intensity, and compared to the logarithmic law given by Malibu and Marusic, both the two scanners also agree with data well. So to sum up, data at hand are not sufficient to make a firm judgment. We do need fresh ideas. That's why we tend to work on the 2D channel flows, because for 2D flows, the simulation cost could be saved significantly. Now, by using our own finite differential code, we have simulated the two-dimensional channel and the three-dimensional channel. Now, for two-dimensional channel, the live situation is solved only in the x and y direction and there's no Z component. And we have simulated 16 cases for the realized number I tau varies from 100 to 8,000. The realized number could be even pursued to higher, but the data trend is already obvious, so we stop at this realized number. For comparison, we also have simulated three-dimensional channel for realized number varying from 500 to 2,000. So at first, let's see two movies generated by the linear data. So the left column shows the 2D channel simulation and the right for the 3D channel simulation. And top rows shows the supervised velocity 
second row shows the autistic normal to the screen, and the bottom row shows the dissipation rate. And this is the up wall, and this is bottom wall. You can see, compared to the 3D channel, there are glaring differences in 2D channel. Specifically, there are very large scale wavy structures developed in 2D channel, occupying almost the entire channel height. And we find that the characteristic streamlined lens for these wavy structures are about four delta, where delta is the flow thickness. And these wave structures, we find that they are generated actually by the anti-rotating vortex parallels. You see that these vortex parallels, they would entrain low, low momentum fluids from the wall to the center and inject high moment of fluids towards the wall, hence causing extreme dissipation rates at the wall. In contrast, for 3D wall flows, there's no such energetic large-scale wave structures. As a result, the inner outer flows in 3D channel flows is loosely interacted compared to that in 2D channel flow. Now we may wonder why these large-scale structures developed in 2D channel, but absent in 3D channel, a natural interpretation is that the inverse energy cascade developed in 2D channel. According to Krishnan and the Bachelor, for 2D flows, small eddies they could form large eddies by vortex condensation, and the flow energy is finally dissipated by the strong friction between the large eddies and the wall boundaries. Now, if so, we should expect a minus five third scaling, uh, spectrum scaling for the velocity, and we should also expect negative energy flux. Indeed, these two features are observed in our center line velocity simulate, uh, uh, velocity signals. So we have calculated the spectrum of center line velocity, and we also uh, derived the two-point correlation, then transformed the two-point correlation into Fourier space and calculate the energy flux by following the steps given by Lee and Moza, and we indeed find that they are lacking energy flux. So we may summarize that. Yes, the inverse energy cascade developed in 2D flows and which then induced vortex condensation and hence induced the large scale anti vortex parallels. We also note that the characteristic streamwise wavelengths for delta uh, of the large scale wave structures, uh, they are located, uh, they are within the minus five spectrum range here. So it indicates that the inverse cascade indeed plays a role to induce the large-scale wave structures. Also, we know that there's minus five spectrum at the smaller scales, indicating the entropy cascade. And both these two scales have been observed in the Corsi 2D experiments, for example, by Sha Keqing from South Tech in China. And then we have also verified that our results independent of the simulation domain and we enlarge our simulation lens from H delta to 24 delta, we find that the statistics and the features of the flow actually are the same. Again, the streamlined wave, streamlined wave lens is about four delta for the large scale wave structures. Now, let's understand why uh, these different fl uh, flow features, uh, uh, how these different flow features would lead to different scalings in the 2D channel. So at first, let's look at the mean friction. According to the work by Inilui Group and the Fockridge, they reported that the friction coefficient in 2D channel should follow the real number minus one half scaling. Now, using the definitions, such a 2D friction law could be converted to RE tau scale as RE three fourth here. And indeed, our simulation data indicated by these solid symbols follow exactly such a three fourth scaling. Now also included are the superfilm quasi 2D experiments marked by the cross symbols here. The data by Fockridge are indicated by the squares here, and our real number, the largest real number in our simulation, is five times larger than ever than ever treated before. 
The inside shows the mean friction is really channel obtained from the logarithmic law. So these two scaling actually are quite different. Here comes the major result of our 2D simulation. We find that for the wall dissipation rate and for the wall pressure RMS, after normalized by the wall variables, they both follow the distinct r eta one third scaling. Also, for the vocal velocity UB and for the peak of the velocity fluctuation intensity U prime R, the RMS of the velocity fluctuation, they both too also follow the r eta one third scaling. Included here are the experimental data for UB from the superfilm experiments. For dissipation and wall pressure MS, there's no data available from experiments yet. Uh, compared to the 3D channel, all of the 3D channel data follow a defective power law as developed by me and the Shinivasan. And you see that the difference is sharp for I tau goes higher and higher because for 2D fluctuation, the fluctuations are unbounded. But for 3D fluctuation, all of the values are bounded by a finite value. So why? Why should we have such a one-third scale for 2D fluctuations? So at first, let's look at the mean velocity profile. Actually, the mean momentum distribution in 2D channel and 3D channel, they have exactly the same balance equation. And the distribution for 2D channel and 3D channel are represented by the dashed line and the solid line respectively for the each terms here. After integration, we find that the mean velocity in 2D channel differs much from that in 3D channel because there is no such log law in 2D channel. There seems a log slope here, but if we have a zoomed in view, we see that the intercept changes dramatically with, with increased real number. Hence, for 2D channel, there is no log law. This is fully consistent with previous flow field visualization because we know that for 2D channel, the inner and outer flow are highly correlated, hence low foundation for the scale separation as argued by Minikin. Thing, thing is, we noted that in previous quasi 2D superfilm experiments, these authors reported that they indeed found the logarithmic law for the mean velocity. However, their data scattered much near the wall. And if I plot their mean velocity data with 3D channel simulation and the 2D channel simulation, we find that their data lies between the 2D and the 3D channel simulations. In other words, 2D and the 3D channel, they offer an envelope for the quasi 2D experiments. Accordingly, if the flow cyclics of the superfilm becomes thinner and thinner, we suspect that the mean velocity would be more akind to our 2D channel simulation, hence no problem. We also examined the energy budget distribution for 2D channel and the 3D channel, and the least towards the wall and the least towards the center line, the left coordinate towards the wall and the right coordinate towards the center line. And you see that the distributions among production, dissipation, diffusion, dissipation, and a nonlinear transport term are quite different in the two flows. In 3D channel, the energy source is the production uh, and its maximum value one force bounds every term here. In 2D channel, we see that the nonlinear term exceeds the production by over 10 times. And uh, together with diffusion and uh, dissipation, uh, they all exceed the bound of the maximum production. Again, this is consistent with the previous uh, flow field visualization because we know that they are anti, they are counter rotating large scale vortices in the flow, hence that they are intensive pressure strength effect and a very large transport effect there. Both these two terms could contribute a very large linear effect, hence exceed the bound of the maximum of production. Now, based on these observations, we now gave the explanation for the scaling law of the UMS peak and wall dissipation rate. For the UMS peak, in 2D channel flow, this peak actually locates in the outer flow range. It not scales at an independent Y plus location. Instead, such a peak scales follows the outer flow cyclics. Actually, it locates at about 0.2 times the flow cyclics. As a result, we argue that the UMS peak follows the scaling of the bulk velocity because the bulk velocity is also a characteristic velocity scale for the outflow. Then we invoked 2D friction law developed by Farquhar here, and we have the one-third scaling for UMS peak. 
Now, the details for the 2D friction law is quite simple. Actually, Fakuis estimated the mean pressure gradient by an added viscosity, and added viscosity is argued to follow the skinny of the square root of molecular viscosity times UB times the flow thickness. And together with the minimum equation, we have such a 2D friction law. Also, by Illinois group, for example, by uh, Nigel Goldenfield, they have also presented an alternative explanation for one third scaling by the consideration of anisotropic cascade. For that part, I will not explain today. Now, let's look at the water dissipation rate. Now, the water dissipation rate it corresponds to the amount of kinetic energy dissipated over a time over a certain time scale. If this time scale scales with the viscous time scale given by L U over U tau, then everything gets back to the law of the wall. This is not the case for 2D channel flows. Instead, since there are larger scale wavy structures influenced on the Lear wall mm -hmm. uh, region, as a result, we argue that the time scale should be given by the viscous length over the outer velocity scale. By this, uh, we have an estimation that the wall dissipation rates in what units scale as the bulk velocity. And then, together with the 2D frictional, we that's at 10, the dissipation rate scale as i tau one third. Then, by dimensional argument, we can extend such a one third scaling to the wall pressure RMS. So, in summary, we have 10, a one third scaling for the fluctuation intensity in 2D channel flows, and this scaling suggests the unbounded 2D fluctuations compared to the bounded fluctuation in 3D channel flows. And we also want to make a comment that the difference between 2D and 3D flows is due to the presence or absence of the vortex condensation. For 3D flows, as there's no vortex condensation, we think that the inflated asymptotic state for 3D wall flows, as suggested by the logarithmic variation, is unlikely. However, we also, we should also note that the inner outer interaction in 3D wall flows may still persist for raised number goes to infinity. In other words, whether the moderate in outer interaction in 3D flows break the law of the wall or restore the role of the wall, we still wait for more data to verify in future. Now, finally, I want to thank Stuart Watson and the collaboration on 3D wall flows. I also want to thank my postdoctor, He Jian Cao, and the PhD students, Duan Pengyu, and the collaboration on 2D wall flows. Thank you very much. I will stop here, and I'd like to take any questions. Thank you. Um Apologize for not giving any warning um, about the approach at no. the end of the talk. And I have no idea how to do that for a virtual participant. Um, questions, comments? Yes, sir. Hello? We, we, if we can, we can try passing the mic in. Or so, just... uh, very nice work. I have a question to you with regard to the, there is a slide where you have shown minus five sort and minus five law. Can you show it one more time? I think these days we also will be giving talks like, you know, just like, you know, video recording without the recording. I think it was a part three. Yes, this one. If you make a, a, an investigation on how, like, you know, the, the, the effect of the interval uh, um, in which you, uh, you yes. make the fit on the result, for instance, moving the left cutoff or the right cutoff for the minus five source region as well as for the minus five region, the minus five, right? And also, was it a minus five or oh, is it exponential? Uh, you mean here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you investigate it, like, you know, the effect of the cutoff, like, you know, for instance, the, the fit interval on the result for the minus five sort uh, subinterval and for the minus five subinterval? Because, you know, the interval can be chosen broader or more narrow. And depending on how you, it will be cut, it, you know, it might, uh, you know, it might or might not have influence on the results. So my question is whether you did this investigation. Did I make it clear? If not, if not, I'm happy to discuss. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, no voice. Oh. Maybe we need some help. Wait a second. Uh, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, yes, yes, I, I think I get your point. Uh, 
uh, I actually I don't know whether yeah I don't know whether the kind of way will influence the result or not I have no idea yet yes. okay. yeah yeah do we have another uh, question yes uh, it was not clear to me these were temporal simulations or spatial simulations can you please clarify The difference between them is that... Uh, at least it's a special simulation. They're special simulations. We so use the periodic boundary condition in a streamwise direction and uh, 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 using okay. the, the... So, in uh, special the, simulation... The, the, the ratio code to simulate this flow. And uh, uh, we stop the Poisson equation and uh, there's no... Uh, this, this is not a temporal simulation result. Okay. So... When one does special simulations, one always looks for a statistical steady state to do an analysis, right? So yes. this is what you did in both of these cases, right? So in a 2D case, you're obviously preventing... Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you. Excuse me. Yeah. In a 2D case, you're sort of impeding, preventing vorticity from developing in a certain direction. So yes. you would expect that actually the transitional yes. part will be much longer, which would explain definitely your inverse yes. cas cascade, yes. because this is what happens in transitional flows, right? So it's not something to be totally sort of surprised by. And so, that part is quite clear to me. And you would expect indeed that 2D and 3D flows would be quite different, right? And you're clarifying that difference. I, I think there is an entire book from Berkeley that is yes. devoted mm. to the difference between 2D and 3D turbulence. And you would expect totally different um, uh, sort of manifestations of turbulence, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I, we, we have only time for one more before we move on. Just a very quick remark. Two-dimensional turbulence and three-dimensional turbulence, completely different things, and uh, this has been done to death by Kreichman and Bachelor in the 1960s, for crying out loud. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, yes. I'm sure we can yes. discuss this further, um, and probably with a lot of agreement. Um, but let's move on to the uh, last speaker of the session. Um, yes. Alex Kremenko. Yeah.